Hello and welcome to Mississippi Insight. I'm Byron Brown. Thank you for joining us. This week we talk one-on-one -on -one with Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman. We are in the best financial shape Mississippi's ever been. The Republican incumbent faces a primary challenge this election year. Our senior political correspondent, Richard Lake, will talk with the LG about Mississippi's economy, our struggling health care network, our roads and bridges, and more. It's all part of our series of 2023 candidate interviews this Sunday on Mississippi Insight. Delbert Hoseman has served in state office for more than 15 years now, and with a re-election campaign for the lieutenant governor's office, he says he's good for at least four more. The Republican and Jackson resident is making a big pitch for re-election, celebrating a stronger state economy and pledging a concerted effort by lawmakers to shore up Mississippi's health care systems. But his campaign for a new term will not go unchallenged, with two contenders preparing to meet him in August 8th primary and a Democratic challenger waiting in the wings. Our senior political correspondent Richard Lake spoke with Hoseman last week as part of WJTV's efforts to interview all the candidates for high state office this year. What's happened to Mississippi through a lot of work, I think, we have been able to cut taxes by $500 million. But we've also been able to add $600 million to infrastructure and $245 million to education. Those are key components to the future of Mississippi. We need an educated person. That's the best asset we've got as a child's brain. And we need an individual that can get their products to market. So that infrastructure and that tax deduction and that education are very, very important. But I will tell you what is helpful as well. We paid off 12% of the state's debt. That's never been done before, Richard. We paid off over $500 million in debt in this state. We haven't borrowed money in two years. That is an amazing thing that the legislature and all of us that worked hard on this. We continue to downsize government. There are 2,300 jobs less now that we, but we did by attrition in state government, so we're shrinking the number of state employees, and yet I think we're doing a better job. I'm real pleased that there, there's a balance here. And we're able to give tax deductions, education, infrastructure, and on the same token, we're able to pay off some of our debt and have a very liquid Mississippi. We have $700 million in our rainy day fund and some cash. I don't know if this ever happened before. Can you talk to you about elimination of the state income tax and mm -hmm. grocery tax as well? We're headed that way because we, we, we had a 5% bracket. We did away with that. Then we went to 4.7. Then we're going to 4.4. Then we're going to 4% in, in two years from now, 2026. Three years from now, we'll be completely at 4%. That puts us at one of the lowest, I think the fifth or sixth lowest among all states at tax. But we're not done yet with that. I mean, you'll see us incrementally continue on to reduce that. We're very interested in the grocery tax. I proposed that two years ago. I proposed it last year. It didn't come out of the Senate in the House. Uh, I think we need to look at the grocery tax again. That's about $440 million in Mississippi, but it's also everybody eats. I think we can start to look at the grocery tax uh, where we can eliminate uh, the critical food needs uh, that people have, uh, maybe not change it on, on sodas or something, but there's a way to start, uh, I think, uh, parsing down the grocery tax for the average consumer. I think you'll see this next year a movement on the grocery tax as well, but the way to do this and the way that has proved out is incremental, slowly, one at a time, taking those deductions down three points, four tenths of a point every time we do that, and still maintaining our financial integrity, being able to pay off our debt, get ready if we have a recession, that kind of thing, build infrastructure, make sure our teachers are paid, you know, it's our living wage. All of those we've been able to do by incrementally cutting taxes, and I intend to continue to do that. I believe the last proposal was to get rid of all taxes by 2036. But if you look at it, we're probably on a faster scale than that. Those incremental cuts, I assume, mm -hmm. is, is the strategy with that too, is to uh, also like give some buffer time in terms of getting some of that revenue back, making up for... That's correct. That Inflation is, is, is rampant right now, as you well know, and interest rates have jumped to about you know, like six or eight percent now, continuing to climb. So that inflation allows us to continue, the state to continue to receive dollars. So we can do this incrementally, and I intend fully to do that. This has been proven by our last two or three years. There's nowhere else where we've had the largest tax cut and reduced the size number of employees and paid off 12% of the state's debt and still not borrowed any money. That saves us probably $30 million a year in interest that I'm sending, was gonna send to New York, some bondholder somewhere. I'm able to keep it right here and reduce your taxes with it. A lot of times people are promised things during a campaign, Richard. <laughs> oh, we're gonna eliminate the income tax. That would be about two billion, about a third of the whole state's budget. 
So um, how are you going to do that? Well, they started, they were going to increase it by 2.5% to sales taxes. Well, that didn't even make up for all of it, so all of a sudden, they just stopped. The way to do this, the smart way to do this, is continue to incrementally cut everything and cut the taxes in state government, and we intend to do that. You've said time and time again that you know, Mississippi's in the best economic shape of, of possibly its history, you said it last session. That is um, correct. What about these policies do you think will keep that momentum going? The biggest thing is educating a workforce. If you look, we're less than 4% unemployment now. You know, it's 3.8 or something percent. Everybody basically that wants to work can work. So what we need to do is make sure we have more people working and that they have better paying jobs. And you do that by educating them. We've actually increased uh, the number of, of children in pre-K by about 6,000. We've actually uh, done dual credit. We've devoted $9 million to a credit that you can take when you're a senior or junior in school at a junior college and community college so that you'll be better educated when you get there. So we're doing all the steps to bring you better and have a better paying job. About 20% or so actually go directly from high school into the workforce, and then another 50% do some training before they get a college degree. So we want to make sure that everybody's going to the workforce, gets a high paying job. If you need an extra year or whatever to learn whatever your skill set is, we do that and we're doing that now. Our community college system is responding. We're paying for dual credit, a lot of good positive things. That's the way we continue the economic boom of Mississippi, is those high paying jobs up at the aluminum factory we just announced. Two new forestry companies are coming here. All across the board, Mississippi's growing. On healthcare mm -hmm. now, priorities for this next term. Well, we have probably in October, we'll start health care hearings here. And our goal is to determine the standard of care in each of the counties in Mississippi and start back looking. Uh, that'll be involved with payors. Our state insurance plan, for example, is a big, uh, covers a lot of people. Uh, there'll be others involved in that, hospitals, doctors, nurses, people that are delivering health care, pharmacists need to be sitting at the table. So we're going to go back and look at what the standard of care is and then what is the cost to get us there. Uh, the first thing to do is always determine what your cost is and what you're trying to achieve, what's your goal. And that standard of care may vary from place to place, and we'll, we'll tackle that this first year out, I think. Yeah. Uh, as I'm sure you well know, Mississippi ranked 51st in health care, uh, according to the Commonwealth Fund's latest state surveys. What needs to be done to climb up those ranks, and how do you think the recent legislation this past session will play into that? Well, fun as you should ask, because this last year, when we looked at this, we put in a community hospital bill. And that community hospital bill allows all of my community hospitals to, burn, to merge together and trade off their assets, their radiology, their technicians, as they deem fit among the local companies. Now, for that matter, I'll be in a, uh, in a hospital that did that in McGee tomorrow, looking at their hospital and how that worked. But you'll see, because we did the community hospital bill, that they can do this now. Hospitals can aggregate among counties and cities and whatnot, can start sharing their assets and their, their different physical plants and their, also their financial assets. I think that's real important. And the Delta Council did a study on this that delivered a week ago Friday. Uh, they hired a guy, Richard Cowart, with Baker Donaldson off in Nashville, that did a study on this, and he recommended this regional concept where we aggregate our assets and whatnot. I think that makes sense. Uh, economically and medically. So I'm, I'm anxious to see, look further into what his recommendations are and see how that fits us around Mississippi. Right. Other than what has been passed, mm -hmm. uh, that passed on uh, this, this past session, um, looking forward, you know, I know you mentioned last session that you, that we kind of need to look at uh, the whole system, just healthcare wise. That's where you, that, that's it. right, Richard. You start with the base, which is what is the standard of care? Now that needs to be OBGYN, internal medicine, emergency room. I mean, we'll define what that is. Once you define the standard of care, then you fund to that. Not maybe fund to an antiquated system or one that's not working or one that's not, you know, uh, economically feasible. You start with the standard of care, then you work up to what the money is. So I'm, I'm real, real confident that we'll, beginning in October, we'll begin those studies and next year we'll have the answer that the legislature has for that. Right. It, it seems a lot, you know, the, the, of course, the, the, the rankings are never what anyone wants to hear, and a lot of the knee-jerk reactions are, how has this not been fixed yet? Um, it, I, I feel like it, that, it, that lawmakers are treating this with intense urgency regarding the health care Well, I am. Right. I, I, I just told you, the first hearing we'll have in October is on health care. 
Now there are other issues. We've got mental health issues, some, some in schools, for example. I'm getting, my teachers are telling me they're having mental health among kids. I want to address that. We did a lot of work on adoptions and child protective services last year. I want to continue to do that. So there are a lot of moving parts to this from really mental health issues all the way through child issues, all the way through uh, grown up issues and, and issues that involve health care. In addition to, we want to keep people off dialysis. We want to be healthy. You know, we want to make sure that they've got access of emergency care. Nobody's too far away that, that, that they lose too much blood and have a catastrophic event. So there are a lot of moving parts to that. Uh, where does expanding Medicaid fit in and all that? Open we'll find out. Yeah. You know, that's, that's such a, a, with all due respect, a, a kind of an easy question for people to run to. But not, not one hospital administrator I've talked to said that expansion would cover all my problems. Not one and I've been just about everywhere in Mississippi. And so that's not the answer. The answer is to start with what we need and fund to that. Now how that works out, I don't know yet, but you don't start with um, none of that. And I, I hadn't had a hospital administrator yet said it would, it, it may help them, but it wouldn't be the answer, not the long-term answer. And what'll happen is we'll be right back here five years from now, having poured more money in it and not have an answer. So I, I think I'm on the right track. We'll continue our conversation with Lieutenant Governor Deborah Hoseman in a moment. But we want to know that we have reached out to his Republican primary challengers. Next weekend, July 9th, we'll bring you Richard Lake's interview with Republican challenger Tiffany Longino. We have also invited Republican State Senator Chris McDaniel to talk with us about his campaign for Lieutenant Governor. We are still awaiting his response. And in the race for the top state office, we plan to bring you our exclusive interview with Republican Governor Tate Reeves on Sunday, July 16th. And our one-on-one -on -one with Democratic challenger Brandon Presley is online now at WJTV.com. Watch this time slot for more candidate interviews and speeches as the campaign season unfolds. We're back in a moment. to crime now, you know, legislative efforts to lower crime mm -hmm. in Jackson specifically. Yeah. Huge topic last session, uh, and House Bill 1020, Senate Bill 2343 are still tied up in the courts. Yeah. Um, your analysis of, of how you think those bills will help, uh, and if that will be uh, a focus on Jackson next term. Well, we, we, two years ago, or like three years ago maybe now, I started funding judges for Jackson. We hired four of them before any of this other legislation was passed. We hired four judges and we looked at the, there was a huge backlog of cases. Some of it came from COVID, some of it came from whatever, but we had a huge backlog. So we started hiring judges and gave uh, Chief Justice Randolph the ability to hire those judges. And they have started having hearings and we're having the judicial system move. And uh, subsequent to that, because of the crime, we have to protect the CCID from Jackson State around to the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And I want you to be able to go to college go downtown in Jackson, and I want you to come to the legislature and go to the hospital without being threatened. So we have, we have mandatory sentencing now, which I'm not, I'm not apologizing for that. We have mandatory sentencing for carjacking, fleeing a police officer with, uh, with physical harm. Those kinds of things need to stop. And I'm, I'm getting good reports from, we've hired 120 people in the Capitol Police Force. I'm getting good reports from how they're conducting themselves meetings inside the community to discuss these issues. But uh, all the people in Mississippi have decided we need a capital that you can go talk to your legislature, go to school, or go to the hospital without being threatened. And I think that's a statewide necessity. So we'll continue to do that until everybody feels comfortable about doing that. A lot of the concerns have come from the community, specifically the black community in Jackson. Mm -hmm. What is your message to, to voters who may, may be just simply scared of, of Capitol Police expanding larger into Jackson? Well, I, I watched, you know, there's a dichotomy there. I watched the, the prints of Sean being out, Sean Tindall, the head of the Highway Patrol, and Bo Weekly out at these neighborhood events. I mean, they have meetings in, in these churches and all over, and they talk about, you know, being, having a relationship. Some people may not like that relationship because maybe uh, the old one that was under the old system wasn't as good as the ones that we're building now with these police in a very small designated area. So I just don't share that. I think our people are being responsive to go talk with them. And as Sean said, you know, that we're going to police this part from Jackson State around to 
through downtown after the university in Fondren, we're going to police that part like we're supposed to. They're going to follow the law, whether it be speeding or shooting someone or whatever. So I just don't see that. The conversations that I watch and, and listen and talk to people about is that they are, um, I would say, very satisfied with the fact that we are helping them. And uh, the whole state of Mississippi is paying for that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see in the long term how it works, but I'm, I'm proud of Sean and I'm proud of Bo going into churches and having sit downs like that. That's really important to get that calming influence and to let, let them know that they're there are people behind that uniform, and they're no different from the people in that church when they're talking to them. They want safety for themselves. They want their children to be able to go outside and play without having shoot, shooting in the house. They, they don't want their child to be shot on the streets. They want their kids to be educated. The same things we do. Those police officers are human. They're just the same as everybody else. And I, I think we, we more humanize them and stop this, let's just shoot at the uniform stuff. Uh, I think we'll see more and more people uh, accept and encourage the, the policing that's going on with the Capitol Police. Right. Crime obviously happens elsewhere other than Jackson. It does. Any, any sort of... Uh, well, the mandatory sentencing applies to Gulfport just like it does to Jackson, just like it does to Tupelo or wherever. So yeah, we're, the things that we're doing are applicable everywhere. We've spent a little over $600 million on infrastructure this year. Um, it's a great priority for us. Interstate 55, Interstate 20, Highway 49, uh, Highway 90 on the coast, all over Miss Highway 15 in Ripley, all over Mississippi, we're doing capacity projects that we didn't have a chance to do before. And that makes it safer for you to go to work, safer for your kids to go to school, to how to get your products to market. So infrastructure is a big deal for us and it will continue to be a big deal as long as I'm there. I think we did 2.3 billion last year. But again, we're doing that while we're reducing taxes and not borrowing money. <laughs> So we're able to do it all right now, and I'm real pleased with the legislature and what we've done. Absolutely. Anything on Jackson Water and that continued struggle, uh, what can Metro voters Well, expect? we did the match like we did for every, uh, for every city. We matched, I think, uh, $37 million or so for them, so it would be about $80, see, $74, $74 million or so that went into Jackson Water. Um, we did that for all the cities, and Jackson put up their money, and, this, and the legislature appropriated a match to do that. Um, there's a huge amount being dumped into here by the, uh, by the federal government, and so we'll just have to let that play out. We are in the best financial shape Mississippi's ever been. We have the brightest future we've ever had, and we can continue to educate our children, reduce our taxes, build our infrastructure. We can do this. We are doing it today. Pay down our debt, all of that. We're doing every bit of that, and that is just the start. And next year's will be even better than the last four we've had. That's Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman talking with 12 News' Richard Lake. We're back with a look at the leadership turmoil in Mississippi's Democratic Party when Mississippi Insight continues. An insult lace email from the chairman of the Mississippi Democratic Party has some members worried. They're concerned it may jeopardize a quarter of a million dollar donation coming from the Democratic National Committee. In an email sent to State Executive Director Andre Wagner over a $250,000 DNC donation, Chairman Tyree Irving personally attacked Wagner's educational history, personal knowledge, and professional accolades. Wagner replied saying that the DNC would not be sending money to Mississippi, citing the chairman's actions. That money would be put to use in political operations throughout the state, including Brandon Presley's bid for governor. 12 News spoke with current and former Democrats about why this flap is so detrimental to their party. Those that consider themselves Democrats and who participate in electoral politics and contribute to candidates just don't have the money. It is absolutely imperative that we are capable of raising money from outside the state. New leadership uh, would reinvigorate morale. It also would show national folks who are interested in uh, helping the actual Democratic Party feel confident that that organization is being ran properly and that support up and down a ticket to candidates can actually take place where candidates can get out and do their job more effectively. Removing Irving as chairman would require a two-thirds vote of the 80-person Democratic Executive Committee. Irving did not reply to repeated requests for comment, but he told MississippiToday.org that no one was informed him of the DNC backing out of the donation. 
We're back in a moment. If you have comments or questions about today's show or a suggestion for an interview or segment, just drop us a line. Email our producers. The address is news at WJTV.com. We want to thank Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman for talking with us this week. We'll be back next weekend with one of his primary opponents, Tiffany Longino, in a similar interview segment. And we'll continue to bring you more of the political and current affairs coverage that you demand. Now, I'm Byron Brown from all of us here at 12 News. Make it a great weekend.